Um, well, what a wonderful turnout. Thank you so much for all coming and giving us the opportunity to share our work with you. This is very exciting. I will talk about two things primarily in this talk. First, I want to talk about how our everyday experiences can very profoundly inf influence how our biological systems work and also how our biological systems and influence how we feel, uh, how we behave, our wealth and our, uh, our health and well-being. And in the second part, I'll talk about why we at HELP are collecting data at the population level uh, to create these child developmental trajectories. Let me start with the question, what do you wish for your children? What do you wish for our children? There was a study done by Lucas and Diener across uh, about almost 100 countries across the world with over 100,000 um, adults asking them, what do you wish for your children? The number one thing they came up with is they want their children to be happy. And then other things that are usually mentioned are also that they want their children to be healthy, that they want to be their children to be connected well to others, that they um, can contribute to their communities and their families in socially responsible ways. As Kim said earlier, on the MDI, we asked children about these five aspects of their well-being as well as other things and from their own perspective. And we find that about half of the children, of all the children we so far have asked in BC, are reporting that they are thriving. They're in the very high range of well-being. Then we have about a quarter in the medium to high well-being and about a quarter into the, in the low well-being. So one of the questions is what differences can we make to make a difference for these children? And again, as Kim said earlier, there are four assets that we find are very, very important for children's well-being during, during their middle years. Adult relationships, how well they feel connected to their peers, the meaningful and um, explorative after-school activities they're engaged in, as well as the nutrition and sleep habits they're, they're having. I'm not going to repeat what Kim said, of course, but I want to, I want to, so Kim said how these things are correlated at one time, and at uh, one time point in the, in the children's life. What do the, what assets do the children have right now, and how is that related to their well-being? What I want to talk about is how do these assets and these everyday experiences profoundly influence the social and biological systems of, of, uh, of us human beings. So if you think about us as human beings, there are several systems that, um, that make us. The, there's the attachment system, there's the immune system, there's the hormone system, there's the nervous system, just to f uh, name a few. And the everyday experiences of how we experience love and care, how we experience nutrition and sleep, how we experience play and exploration activities, how we uh, experience teaching and learning, they profoundly influence how these different systems work. And in turn, those systems profoundly influence how we feel, how we behave, what our uh, well-being and what our health is, not just today, but over a long time. Let me start with talking about love and relationships and attachment. Here you see two rhesus monkeys a mother and her child. And in the wild, it's quite common that uh, rhesus monkey babies develop a very close bond with their, with their mothers. In experimental research, um, quite cruel actually, they can artificially create situations of neglect. So they would separate, here you see two young rhesus monkeys, they would separate these young rhesus monkeys from their mothers. So basically, they're growing up without their mothers and only with the same age peers. What you find then that a majority of these, uh, these monkeys has very different social skills than the children who grow up with their mothers. They're much more aggressive, they're much more fearful, but not only you, you don't only see differences in their behavior, you also see differences in the way their stress regulation system works. It's not working as properly. You also see differences in how their brain works, and you even see differences in how different genes are switched on and switched off. And we now understand that depending on how different genes we all have are switched on and off during early years, 
that can in turn affect how our hormone systems function, how our immune system functions, and we know that some of the switching on and switching off is regulating our aggressive, aggressiveness and stress regulation. So you see there's a very, very direct interaction between what we experience socially and how our, how our biological systems work. If you think, what does this have to do with human beings? Here's research they did with, um, with adult men, and they basically asked them in surveys whether they experienced high childhood adversity or high or low childhood adversity. So they separated into two groups. Then you see two lines, the top line, the green line. These are men who have a short form of a gene that's involved in regulating aggression. And then if you look at the blue line, you see um, th those are the men who have a long form of that same gene that's regulating aggression. Then they also look at the criminal, record, criminal records and they looked at their uh, level of aggression. And what you see is that for all, of, for all these groups, for all these men, if they experience high adversity, then their aggression goes up. But to what extent this aggression goes up is much more pronounced for the green line than for the blue line. So here's another case of seeing how early social experiences very, very profoundly affect how, um, how genes interact with our behavior and that's you know, how that affects behavior 10 or 20 years later in, in these children's, in these young men's lives. Let me give you another example about nutrition. Here you see two mice and they look completely different but they're genetically identical. They were bred to be genetically identical. The only difference between these two mice is that during their gestation period, so before their birth, the mothers were fed different diets. The mothers of these children received a very plain diet, high enough in calories, but not a lot of nutrients. And these were supplemented with certain nutrients that are important for making our DNA function properly. So what does DNA does? It copies all the genes in our cells. So when, while the children are growing in the womb of the little mice, um, for these mice, there are very, very few mistakes being made when, they, when their genes are replicated. Whereas for these children, if, um, where the DNA does not work properly because they didn't have the right nutrients in, their di in the maternal diet, there are many mistakes happening in that replication process that leads to much higher rates of obesity, even different fur color, and we, in those mice you also see higher rates of cancer and much lower expectancy for life and or higher mortality. So again, very profound in interactions between everyday experience like nutrition and later functioning of biological systems. So again, here's an example, if you think that only pertains to mice, um, here's a study that they did with um, uh, women in Gambia in West Africa. And what this plot shows is the birth weight according to birth months of these children. So you go from January all the way to December, and you see that the line is much higher for the children who were born in the first half of the year compared to the second half of the year. So what's happening? Well, in that country, the first half of the year is a harvest season. So these these women eat, nutri uh, eat uh, diets that are very rich in nutrients. Uh, this is the hungry season, so these women are not starving, but they don't have all the nutrients they need to uh, properly develop their, their, their children in the womb. So it makes perfect sense that these children have different birth weights, but what's amazing is after con control for all these different factors once they, once they live, once it, once these children are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they have also much higher uh, likelihood of dying of infectious diseases. So it's, again, it's not something, the, the diet of the mothers is not something that affects the birth weight of the children right there and then, but it also affects how the biological systems are programmed and function over decades of their life, life course. Let me now talk about an example from play which I think is completely underestimated and forgotten in terms of uh, early childhood education. So here you see two children playing um, in the woods or on a, on a flower field. Uh, I'll again start with the uh, <laughs> study they did with, with animals, in this case brown bears up in Alaska. So research team spent hundreds and hundreds of hours observing 13 families, uh, mothers with their cubs in the wild. And what they found is 
that the bears who en engaged the most in social play were most likely to survive that year as well as the next year. That's how long they followed them. And their hypothesis is that um, social play is the best exercise you can do for, for your brain and also the best exercise to uh, learn social and other skills that help you to, so, uh, to socially interact with others and to also comp uh, um, cope with all the stresses that life throws at you. Another very interesting finding about the meaning of play, here you see different brain sizes and on the left axis here you see the number of social play and here you see relative size of brain regions that have social and cognitive, motor, emotional and visual functions. And what you see when you compare different species, let's say different primates, um, um, mice, rats, uh, even in birds you see that. If you compare all these species and you look at how much they play socially and how long their childhood is during which they socially play, you see that the more these um, species play, the higher, relatively speaking, are their brain regions for that, that are important for all these different uh, functions. And of course, we humans are, of all animals, we're the species that plays the most and it has the longest period, relatively speaking, of childhood. This is perfectly in line with what research finds in terms of social pretend play and theory-based programs. And so in fact, the, social, the research finds that social pretend play and developmental theory-based programs that integrate different forms of play have positive long-term associations with social, emotional, and cognitive skills and behavioral outcomes. So what I was trying to get at with this introduction of the, you know, the first, first part of this talk is that some of the things we do every day have very, very profound influences of how our social and bio, how our biological systems work. So now I'll get to the second part of the talk. Why do we at HELP collect population-based measures? First, I want to talk about geographical variability. Kim already showed you some maps for Coquitlam, and I want to point at one particular example. In this case, it's breakfast because I talked about nutrition. The one neighborhood that's now circled in dark black, uh, Westwood, you see that there is a proportion of about 10 to 15 uh, percent of the children who don't regularly eat breakfast. And right next to it, there's a neighborhood where all the children say they regularly eat breakfast. You see in Vancouver, there are some neighborhoods where there are even higher rates of, of um, children who don't regularly eat breakfast in some neighborhoods, even though we also have some neighborhoods where all the children regularly eat breakfast. So what's the point of this? Uh, if you're a community planner, it's not important to know that nutrition is important. It's not enough to know that nutrition is important, but you need to know what the variability is from one community to, to the next to act on this. Uh, we find the same kind of variation when it comes to after-school activities. In this case, uh, for music activities on the far up right, the, the neighborhood that was now circled, you see that only a quarter of the children engage in musical activities, whereas you look at Borquitlam, um, lower left side, over half of the children engage in musical activities. I'm not saying that musical activities are the one and most importantly, important thing, but we see the same type of variability for all types of after-school activities. We see the same type of variability for all types of relationships, peer relationships and adult relationships. So once again, for community planners, for schools, it's very important to have this information at a representative local level. And that's why we collect these, um, this data at the population level. The next thing you can do with population me level measures is to, you can examine whether the, the findings you are have, uh, finding are representative for the whole population. What I mean by this is the following. I'll show you a study they did in Manitoba where they um, first looked at past tail rates for all the children who took the standardized test in grade 12. So these are all the children on the school's record. And then they put these children in four different groups. So low socioeconomic status, low to middle, middle and high socioeconomic status. And what you see is that there's a socioeconomic, socioeconomic gradient. So you see that in the low socioeconomic status group, 57% fail, then you go up to 78%, and for the highest two groups, you see 87% of these students uh, pass the test. Well, now they linked the data to the health records 
to see whether all the students who are took the test actually repre pre represent the entire population. Once you do that linkage, a completely different picture emerges because by the time children should have reached grade 12 according to their age and according to who we know is in the province, we see that a large proportion already withdrew from the entire school system, that's the, the, the light part on the top of the graphs. Many of the children are uh, in grade 11 or lower. Many of the children didn't take the test. Many dropped the course or had an incomplete test. And so the pass and fail rate, if you look at the entire population you, you, that could have taken the test, is much, much lower than if you just had looked at the education records. Variability across subgroups. Now I'll talk about a topic that's quite grim and sad. It's about youth suicide. And if you, if you hear about youth suicide, one statistic that you may have heard about is that overall, the youth suicide rate for Aboriginal youth is higher than for the overall population. But that statistic is not very useful for understanding some of the phenomena and some of the underlying mechanisms that may be related to youth suicide. Here, and this is based on Michael Chandler's research, you see a plot of all the Aboriginal bands and the number of suicide that, uh, youth suicides that occurred between 1987 and 2000. And what you see is that more than half of these Aboriginal bands never recorded a single youth suicide. Then you see quite a lot of bands had youth suicide rates that are very close to the overall average. But then what's very painful is that there are few bands that have painfully high and very, very sadly high rates of youth suicide. So in the next step, this research team then try to uh, find relationships. Um, what are the factors that can be used to explain these differences in youth suicide rates? And as Kim said earlier, many people often go to Stats Canada, look at socioeconomic status, but socio socioeconomic status doesn't really explain a lot of variability when it comes to these youth suicide rates. What does explain a lot of oops, variability are these factors that are proxies for whether there's uh, cultural continuity and cultural identity occurring in these different bands. They looked at whether the bands self-govern, whether they had, were involved in pursuing land claims, whether they had autonomy and control over their own education system, whether these bands uh, could be, um, were autonomous for their own health services, for their police, fire services, and whether they had cultural facilities in which they could practice the cultural traditions and pass them on among communities that are important for these, for these communities. And what you then find that there is a very, very strong correlation between those factors and the youth suicide rates. All the, all the bands that, don't, that didn't have any of those cultural identity markers present in the community, very high youth suicide rates then the moment they start to have some of these markers present in the community, the rates drop and drop. By the time the community has all these six identities, uh, identity markers or proxies in their community, youth suicide was completely absent. So again, we see there's a very strong correlation between the assets that really matter, as we saw for the MDI, and we see the same kind of principle emerging uh, ac across studies and across research. Why multiple cohorts? So as many of you know, as, as many of you know, we have collected the uh, EDI data for now 12 years. And what's emerging is that we can, we can look at trends over time. Here, is the, here are the results for one school district in the lower mainland. And the fact that all these lines go up over time means that the vulnerability rates are increasing. So things are not getting better, but uh, if anything, they're probably getting worse overall in, in BC. But there are a few neighborhoods or a few communities that are bucking the trend, where we see that the vulnerabilities actually go down. And so now that we have worked hard for 12 years to collect these trend data, we're now trying to understand what are the things that are going on in the neighborhoods where the trends go up as opposed to where the trends go down to really understand what's making the difference in regard to uh, outcomes at the kindergarten age. 
why longitudinal trajectories? Clyde, in his introductory comments, said that our vision is to collect data that ranges all the way from birth, goes through the early years, and then we have the EDI here at kindergarten age. We're now collecting data on the middle years and then later on in adolescence because, of course, in order to understand developmental trajectories, you don't just want to know where children are at a given time and point. You also want to know where they're coming from and where they're going after. And the one linkage we now were able to establish is the relationship between the EDI and the MDI. So this year, for the first time, we were able to link EDI results to MDI results. And I'll show you a couple of things that we start to see once we look at the data. Here are the children who had the lowest 20 fell into the lowest 20% of the EDI scores. And what you see is if you look at their MDI, out, uh, MDI outcomes, is that the odds for ending up in the low well-being as opposed to the thriving are about equal. So you have about 40% um, of these children who fall into the low well-being category and about 40% who fall into the high or thriving category. If you compare that to the children who were in the highest 20%, on the EDI, you see, I'm not sure what happened to the numbers. Um, disregard the numbers, please. These should be uh, not here. Um, if you look at the highest 20% of the EDI scores, the odds are completely different. You see that about two thirds of the children now end up in the thriving category, whereas only about 20% uh, end up in the low well being category. But what's really important, even though there's this prediction, as Clyde and Kim mentioned earlier, what's really interesting is that we see trajectories that go from low EDI score to high score on the well-being. So after all, children who had low EDI scores, there's still a significant proportion who ended up in the high and the high thriving well-being um, uh, index for the MDI. And vice versa, we also have children who were very, very high rated by their teachers in kindergarten but there's still a significant proportion who ends up in the low uh, well-being category. In other words, we have some trajectories that are high, high. We have some trajectories that go from high to low. We have some trajectories that go from low to low, and we have some trajectories that go from low to high, all of these combinations. And of course, the question we're really trying to answer is what are the things that happening in are happening in between to really explain why uh, Ideally, we have the children who start out low. How do we get them to a place where they're thriving later on? And one of the key findings is that here are the children that are thriving in grade four, and here are the children that have low well being in grade four. And what you see is that all the children who are thri thriving report more than four assets on average whereas all the children who are low on well-being report less than three assets. So as Kim mentioned earlier, all these assets we provide for children, they're things that we can do something about, and I guess that's my take-home message. If you want to make a difference for children in their life, if you're connecting with the children, with the youth in your life, if, if you're allowing them to engage in activities that are meaningful, that are playful, if you're allowing them to establish healthy health and nutrition habits, then the chances are that you're making a very, very important difference for these children in their lives. And with that, I'd like to, again, thank Jeremy and the whole team for helping with preparing the slides and setting this up, and um, like like to thank you once again for your time and listening. Thank you. <laughs>